But Sony was one of many intellectuals, many artists, who during the fascist period was very much involved with the regime, participated in exhibitions and uh, prizes and so on. But like practically everyone, when fascism fell in July 43, had to make a choice. And he's somebody who really began to look at fascism again with fresh <coughs> eyes after the fall. And so here we have uh, what looks like um, a group of squadristi immediately after the First World War, perhaps 1920, 21, um, torturing, we presume, a socialist, pulling a tooth out. Essentially, it seems to me a, a reflection in the middle of the war, a time when fascism is collapsing in 1943, on the essence of fascism. That fascism is a movement that is born out of violence, out of the First World War, and out of squadrism. This is the essence of fascism. This is how it began. This is how it's going to end amid brutality on the appalling scale. Violence is very much the center of fascist ideology. A lot of controversy about the extent to which one can talk about fascist ideology. But certainly the celebration of war and violence is central to the regime. And then there was the appropriation of Mussolini, Mussolini's image by the avant-garde. What uh, the uh, avant-garde artists tended to do with Mussolini's image was, was basically to transform it into an almost uh, sort of uh, machine type image. The futurists were obsessed with machines and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and so what they did was to manipulate uh, Mussolini's image uh, so as to turn it into something almost machine-like, uh, but also almost like a weapon uh, or a sort of um, a a metallic body. Eh? So basically, they took this man, they took the image of Mussolini, and they sort of manipulated according to their vision, um, which was an, wasn't just an artistic vision, but also symbolized the, the idea of uh, a modern Italy. Mussolini could take up different uh, personas, and you know he was depicted in very different ways, um, and. You only need to slightly change the um, sort of facial features or the, the, the sort of pro you know, physical proportions of the figure to turn, you know, this uh, you know, figure into a, a caricature. This is quite interesting. I use these images for uh, one of my courses that I teach, and one of my um, students uh, observed that this particular image, Paolo Garretto, Benito Mussolini, 1926, was a bit disquieting. This student of mine said, oh, I don't like that. So you see something that uh, you know, was meant to uh, promote a specific image of Mussolini as very modern, dynamic, machine-like, uh, weapon-like uh, body could be also have a negative connotation. I think this head of Mussolini is actually quite an interesting example of both the direction that avant-garde art in the 1920s and then early 30s took um, when representing Mussolini and also the um, almost uh, sort of uh, the almost grotesque and caricature-like quality that a lot of avant-garde works uh, portraying Mussolini, in effect, uh, feature. Um, it, it has the typical feature of uh, um, sort of the, the, the representations of Mussolini by the avant-garde. He's uh, portrayed with a helmet, uh, which of course gives uh, uh, this image a sort of military quality. Uh, the, the face is, uh, of course, uh, uh, represented in a sort of almost uh, grotesque uh, or caricature-like fashion. 
uh, with uh, some of uh, Mussolini's uh, typical features exaggerated, uh, like uh, the jawline uh, uh, or the expression. Some critics have also pointed out uh, that uh, this uh, head of Mussolini almost looks as though it's dissolving, uh, as though it's collapsing. Uh, and, um, and so it is uh, difficult, uh, in a way, to establish uh, uh, whether this is uh, you know, um, a, a representation, an avant-garde representation of Mussolini or a critique of Mussolini. Uh, there's no doubt that, uh, that some of the best artists in Italy at the time were actually very pro-Mussolini and pro-fascist regime, definitely throughout the 1930s. It's only around 1938 that we start to see some of the, um, you know, the beginning of a kind of disillusionment with, uh, with the regime, probably because of the uh, increasing um, uh, links with, uh, with Nazi Germany. The image of Mussolini changed from being a sort of fearful, warlike uh, leader who evoked you know, some of the Roman emperors of the past or possibly even you know, the god of war, Mars, became a somewhat pathetic figure. Uh, the lackey of Hitler, um, the person who was tagging along, um, who was the junior partner in the coalition. Um, already in 1939, um, uh, this picture shows us that there is uh, um, a growing sense of unease with the regime. This is, of course, very much underground. You know, no one saw this picture at the time. I think the title I chose for, for this talk was Mussolini Grotesque. And I think what I wanted to capture in that title was something of the exaggeration and distortion that Mussolini as a man underwent when he was represented through caricatures and cartoons and also in some written satirical pieces. And I think in a way it's that um, exaggerated image of Mussolini that has come down to us. And I think you know, that, that sort of close binding of Mussolini the dictator and Mussolini the caricature figure is, is something that perhaps needs to be reflected on and just sort of unpicked a little bit. The intense gaze, you know, becomes this sort of uh, rather odd, uh, um, you know, expression, you know, completely unfocused. You know, the lips, uh, which uh, uh, many images, official images of Mussolini, um, uh, used as a way to balance off uh, the, the rather sort of squat, otherwise, um, uh, features, uh, you know, facial features, uh, you know, here become, you know, extremely sort of, uh, um, you know, stretched and, uh, and inflated. Um, and um, the, uh, the jaw, which, uh, you know, had such a highly symbolic um, uh, meaning uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, conveying ideas about, you know, the, the, the sort of power and the strong-willed uh, determination of, uh, of the leader. Here, you know, starts to get that sort of strange sort of uh, roundness and softness, which uh, will then, you know, become uh, in, uh, in later years, in, in, in the um, uh, production of Zancanaro, uh, will turn into, you know, this... Uh, um, you know, almost monstrous, you know, double chin, you know, with, you know, this abundance of, uh, of flesh. Zancanaro was a figure who was best known in the local context. He was uh, an anti-fascist, not an artist who had ever been associated with the fascist party, not an artist who had ever received public commissions. What he began drawing in 1937 was a long series of sketches of a figure he called Il Gibbo. Il Gibbo was a creation of a grotesque nature who was obviously meant to be Mussolini and who was the result of a series of suggestions and influence that in Zancanaro's mind blended into this Mussolinian figure, Il Gibbo. And Zancanaro drew uh, drew more and more of these sketches as the war went on. And the top one is uh, a sketch from 1943 which depicts an aging, decrepit, naked Mussolini who is grabbing onto a chair that is clearly not a throne, it just looks like a, a wooden uh, kitchen chair. We can see that the figure is tired 
uh, the figure, I think we can say, more or less looks masculine, uh, although it's not entirely clear if he's human, because we've got one hoof and one foot. Um, the Jibbo figure is wearing a, what looks like a sort of net g-string, which is filled with tiny figures of naked women. Whenever Zancanaro included female figures, he was referring to two things. He was referring to the reputation of Mussolini as a womanizer, but he was also referring to the relationship between Mussolini and the Italian people. Virtually every country is represented through a female allegorical figure, and that is certainly the case of Italy too. The figure is known as Italia, and very often the uh, young women who are depicted in the paintings, in the sketches, um, represent Italy. Uh, and I think we can say that Zancanaro is not merely satirizing the person of Mussolini, but is trying to understand something of the relationship between Mussolini and the Italian people, and something of the reasons for the strange success of fascism, even to the point, as we can see in the crowd here, of applauding and saying, we want war. One goes into the late 30s, and, and once the war starts in 1940, growing despondency among Italians about Italy's war effort, growing anger towards um, local authorities, towards the fascist party in particular, but not necessarily declining support for Mussolini. This, it's very extraordinary the way in which the person of Mussolini is removed psychologically from the regime. And we find that a lot of the um, disasters that befall Italy from 1940 in the war are ascribed by ordinary people not to the Duce himself, but to traitors, people around him who failed to keep the Duce properly informed about what was happening. 